Yes, welcome back to the Hibs Ramble, episode 37, and we've got a very special episode because it's only once in a blue moon that all four of us are here. I'm joined by Liam, Craig and Sean. How are we, boys? I'm all right, how are you? Good, mate, I'm good. You need to introduce yourself, Mark. That's what you do as the host, you introduce yourself. That's... Everyone knows it's me. Everyone knows it's me, it's fine. <laughs> well, it's a, a doubly special episode because it's the first time that I've been given the opportunity to take the reins and host. So not only is it a full house, but you have me for the first and last time hosting the episode. <laughs> um, but we're fresh off the back of a defeat to Celtic at Celtic Park. Who saw that one come in? Um, I think there was a the, the hot topic before the game was the the starting lineup. Who we were going to play? How we were going to set out? Would we go for Celtic and maybe get pumped again, or would we? set up quite defensively. Liam, what was your take on it before the game? How did you want us to set up and how did that compare to the starting lineup? I, To be honest, I wasn't actually too sure. I wasn't at the 6-1 game. So um, I don't know particularly how we how we set up and how we kind of tried to attack Celtic. But I thought that having seen them at Easter Road... That we, we could have had a go at them. So when the team came out and there was about 17 left backs in the starting eleven, uh, I was I was a little bit confused. I was trying to, you know, work out the shape in my head, and it it was it was a wee bit confusing. But to be honest, see, in hindsight, after Ellie Yuan got sent off, I think Lee Johnson couldn't have picked a better team. To be honest with you. Yeah, and I mean you touched on it there. The 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 red card. It was a bit of a defensive start. Um, Celtic, as we expected, had the lion's share of possession, had the better chances, but we did seem to be keeping them at bay. But after about 20 minutes, a difficult task became almost impossible when Eli Yuan got sent off. Craig, what was your initial reaction and thoughts on the red card? Um, I didn't, well, he was obviously his first booking, I still don't think was even a booking. Um, I don't think it was either. And, right. uh, the linesman doesn't give a foul, doesn't he wave his flag? Uh, and like we said about the team, like we were all sitting as the team came out and we tried to, we almost needed a fucking physics degree to work out between us who was playing where. Um, <clears throat> it was a very defensive start, but you know with the quality of opposition that you're up against that, um, you know, if, you, if we were to be bold and go and attack them, they would just pick holes in us. So it was a case of... Keeping it, it was like a five four one, just keeping it as solid as we possibly could, um, and taking a chance if and when it came. But the red card, I mean, you, the view that we get, I mean, this isn't a dig at the whole pillar thing at Celtic Park, right? The view, even if that pillar wasn't there, the view for that corner is shite, right? It, it is, it's just shite. You're so far away for the pitch, and when it happened. I initially, like, because it looked like Carter Vickers went down with a head knock. The ref seen it and then still played on, which if it's meant to be a head knock, the game's meant to stop straight away. Um, And then I kind of looked away and looked back and just seen Ellie walking off. I didn't even realise at the time that it had been sent off. And then when you watch it back again, it's even, it's just mental. It's absolutely mental how he's been given a, a second yellow. For that, when Carter Vickers makes himself about three foot tall after muscling him off the ball and causing Ellie to be off balance anyway. Sean, it'd be interesting to get your take on things, obviously having that sort of view and the, the live replays. So what, what was your take on it? I think I can't really say any more than what Craig's already just said, if I'm completely honest. I can. I, I, I don't think the first one's a yellow at all. Linesman doesn't give anything. <laughs> Um, that's obviously my opinion on it I can see maybe why the ref maybe thought to give a foul but definitely not a yellow card but only because Ellie jumps in but that's because Starfelt's kicking the ball backwards so for that one that that isn't a yellow card ever it's his first foul as well and it's five minutes in yeah a, a, an absolute push you could maybe understand giving a foul if the linesman's giving it but the ref's miles away and even the lino's not giving it second one Carter Vickers, and I, I want to touch on Carter Vickers later on for the the penalty, but Carter, Carter Vickers is very, very smart there. <sighs> Eli Yuan's pushed back into him. Eli Yuan's got both his arms around him. They're both kind of at it. Obviously, Carter Vickers is much, much stronger. Goes to 
pull onto the ground so then Carl Vickers can try and get in front and win the ball or, or win the header. But by that point, like Craig said, he's he's almost at the ground. So he's endangering himself by putting his, his head down there. And if he doesn't do the notion of, of pulling Ellie Yuan's shoulder and pulling him down, Ellie Yuan doesn't fall and then doesn't kick him in the head. It just doesn't happen. Uh, Cal McGregor's right next to it and he doesn't even claim for anything. He goes to play on. I don't know who it is that screams, but someone screams for it. And it isn't until after the ball's away that the person screams for it. And then um, the referee pulls it back and then gives them the yellow card. I, it's two very, very baffling decisions because at, at the beginning of the second incident, you could argue that it's a foul in our favour. That's what I that's what I felt watching it back. Like you can argue, you could probably argue it's a foul either way. Yeah. But whatever way it goes, it's not a booking. Nah, never. Like, nah, I completely agree with Sean. First day, the whole the referee for that whole day. No, I I completely agree with what Sean said in terms of if Carter Vickers doesn't pull Yuan back to get in front of them, then Yuan doesn't go to kick that ball and doesn't kick him in the face. So, for, for me, it's a foul on, for us, I think we should get that free kick. You should play the advantage and then pull it back. Never a, a yellow card and a second yellow and a red for me. Um, Hibs, though, still persisted. We held them back and then we managed to actually take the lead to a, a, a penalty. Liam, what was your thoughts on that one? Did you think that was a penalty? Because it was a penalty, obviously, either side of the half. And for me, if you give one, you've got to give the other. But what was your take on it? Not a great view, to be honest. Craig's already touched on it. The view from where we get in, in that away section isn't great. Uh, it's, it's not like a, like a, a, a slagging because there's three other corners who probably get the exact same view. But it's very difficult to tell when you're that far away. It couldn't have been further away from us, to be quite honest with you. But I thought initially there was a high foot. I don't think that that's what it was given for. I've not actually seen it back, to be honest. But um, I think like, it was a pull on the jersey. Yeah, a pull on the jersey. But what I I thought he was initially foul, uh, not foul. But I thought the the linesman initially flagged for offside. Um, I could be wrong, but that's what it looked like from where I I was standing. And then you just see the referee with his, with his hand to his ear, and I'm thinking. I actually turned to my dad and I said, "There's absolutely no way that he's going to give this, even if he goes to the monitor." He's not going to give it. And if he does give it, we're not going to score it. But uh, <laughs> thankfully, thankfully uh, for that for that moment, he did give it and, and we did score it. But no, I think Lee Johnson touched on it in his post-match. You know, if you're going to give every single one of them, you're going to have four or five penalties every single week. So it's not, it's not ideal, I don't think. I think we touched on it earlier in the season. This is just kind of the teething problems for VAR. They're given, you know, anything and everything, um, which is, you know, it's, it's a pro and a con in the same token. Because if, you know, if, if we'd have held on for a one 0 win, no one would be really complaining about it. But no, like you said, that was an not an identical one, but an equally as soft foul uh, in the in the second half, and it was given as well. But to be fair, uh, Josh Campbell, he stepped up, loads of pressure, Celtic Park. And he slotted it away. Now, you know that I'm a big advocate of limbs. Craig, Liam, <laughs> what did you think of that one? It was a good, so I was right on the the, the ticker tape divider. Um, and if it was not for that one wee steward about half my size, I would have been right in amongst them. But thankfully... <laughs> one wee steward and a bit of, uh, a bit a bit of red and white tape. Aye. Um, but it's funny, because I'd said to Alfie, like, I turned to him probably about a minute or two before the penalty was given that if we're going to score, we're going to have to hope for like a, a free kick in a deep area or a corner. And then lo and behold, we got the penalty for a long throw. Um, and just because of who threw it, I thought Lewis Miller done, done really, really well, considering it was his first start. Um, but uh, the limbs were... I've not been to Parkhead in ages, or Celtic Park or that, so it was a good, it was a good healthy set of limbs, that one, followed I by a rendition of... Uh, yeah. If it wasn't for the high, we should be huns. That got them fair, fair riled up as well. It was the, it was the first time I've seen a score at Parkhead since um, uh, the, the game where Martin Boyle and Cam Berry scored when we had the diamond. 
Uh, the diamond strip, but we were wearing the luminous yellow one that day. Mm. And Boyle dinked the goalie. But it was it was great limbs. I think it's the first time I've seen us go one up at Parkhead as well. So uh, we retained our we retained our took the lead against the old firm trophy from uh, from the Rangers game <laughs> the road as well, which was lovely. Um, you touched on it there, Craig. Uh, a brilliant individual performance from Lewis Miller. I think the other player worth a shout is Jake Doyle Hayes. I thought they both played brilliant considering they were coming back for injury. What yep. was your thoughts on their performances? Um, I thought Miller was, well, like when the team came out and like I said, we were sitting sitting looking at it and it was like Miller and Doyle Hayes. Bit of a risk, but I think they, they showed an abundance why they were worth the risk. I know we ended up getting beat 3-1, but in terms of them individually, like, you know, throughout the game, Miller had made a Jota, eventually Abada, um, up against them, and we never got much change out of them. You know, it goes to show that the, I know the last goal was in the last couple of minutes, so it's kind of irrelevant, but it took this free-flowing Celtic side, a penalty and a corner, to breach us. So that just goes to show you that not even, you know, Miller and, and Doyle Hayes in the middle of the performance they put, and especially going down to 10 men, like it was, ironically, I actually think it suited us more going down to ten. No, it, I completely it, agree. It made us defend like we never really had an outball. Like it was literally like the Alamo. Every time Marshall or Fish or Hanlon got the ball and launched it, it was literally just coming right back. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's kudos to to Miller and Doyle Hayes, but and also you need to look at Stevenson again, written off by so many people up against the same players that Miller was when they were interchanging. You know, Maidan, Maidan ended up going off 60 minutes, I think. You know, the, Kyogo never got any change at the defence, which included Chibraya at left centre half. So, I think individually and collectively, it was a, it was a performance to be proud of. Um, I'd actually especially, be... especially for me, for Doyle Hayes and, uh, Doyle Hayes and Miller, given their, their severe, in Miller's case more so than any, like their severe lack of game time this mm -hmm. season. I'd be... Actually, quite interested to find out what Sean thought because it was it's such a weird one that we're sitting here talking about a three-one defeat. But you know, I thought I, I thought genuinely every player played out their skin and, like and put in a really top-class performance. Like we didn't deserve to win it. Like I don't think anybody could argue that we would have deserved to win that game. Probably Toil even got a point based on when you look at it on the face of the stats. But I. Performance-wise, it'd be interesting, like what you thought of it, Sean, because you would have had a better view of it mostly than what we did. Yeah, I was. I said last week that I was. We all knew that we were going to get beat. I was just more curious to learn more about the squad and Lee Johnson in regards to how they were going to set up. Um, and the fact that it went down to ten men, I think for me, I feel a lot more confident in a lot of the players' performances, both collectively and individually. There was a lot of, of good, solid individual performances throughout the squad. Um, yes, there was the odd mistake here or there, especially in the second half, but you know, you're playing against a free-flowing Celtic side and you're down to 10 men and it's backs against the wall. You've got no out-ball, like you have both said. It was hard to watch, obviously, um, but there's a lot to take from it in regards to you know performance and shape. And things like that as well, and it just goes to show that you know we're uh, yes we conceded three goals, but if you look at the manner, like Craig said already, the manner of those three goals, if you take that away, I don't like I said, I don't think we would have actually got anything from it. But from a, a player's perspective, there'll, there'll be a lot of confidence taken from that. The coaching staff will take a lot from that, um, and the fact that it was at Celtic Park as well. Yes, I know it's still. 11 v 11 on the pitch but the actual situation around it it, it won't do the squad any harm um, whereas if it was 11 v 11 and we'd maybe been beat 3-1 and there was maybe more errors made which led to the goals then that could have a detrimental impact on the players performance uh, mentally going forward with the big games that we've got coming up but the fact that it was we were down to 10 for so long and unrightly so as well I think it just made the group come closer together. Sean, I'd be interested to get your take on the Celtic penalty as well. They obviously equalised from the 
the spot. Um, do you think that it's one of the where the referee had to give it because he gave us one and it was probably equally as soft, or did you think one was more than the other? Well, what, does he give us our one because of the red card? Would would be my question. Is it a is is it a catalogue of errors where he's constantly trying to redeem himself throughout the match? That's kind of how it felt to me in the second half. So, Paul ha- for our one, just quickly, Paul Hanlon obviously doesn't go to the ground. He feels a stamp on the back of his leg, then the back of his calf, I think it is, or his ankle, and there's a pull on the shirt. Most players would go down for that and then would be looking and asking for the penalty, but because he stays on his feet and he's only really there to try and flick on the ball, you know, the penalty isn't initially given. Thankfully it was, but when it was given... Part of me, I did think it was that soft that has he maybe just leant towards giving the foul because he's maybe thought that he's maybe made a mistake earlier on. I don't know. As for Celtic one, um, controversially, I actually don't think that is a penalty, um, which goes against the vast majority of what I've actually seen online. Um, Carter Vickers and Paul Hanlon are hugging each other at the start like you always see at the beginning of corners and they're both at it but as soon as the ball actually is taken as soon as the corner is actually taken Paul Hanlon is doing everything he can to let go of Carter Vickers and just track him Carter Vickers I don't know if you've watched it back he's got his arm he's, um, like his arm he's, 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 he's hooking ball. he's hooking him in very similar to the only instance I can really think is what Ramos done to Salah in the Champions League final where he's like dragged him to the ground Carter Vickers does that to Paul Hanlon, and Paul Hanlon is just getting dragged around in a circle, and that's why he can't let go. So for me, out of the two, ours is a penalty, and theirs isn't. Ours is very soft, and I think, again, Carter Vickers has played it very, very well, knowing that even if it's not given, it could go to VAR, and then it is given. So for me, Celtic won no, our one slightly yes I would be leaning more to yes for everyone but the Celtic one isn't and it's purely just because he's, he's like I said he's played it he's played it brilliantly he's got him locked in he's not letting him go Paul Hanlon's getting dragged around in a circle and then what's Paul Hanlon meant to do is part of Rickers just drags him to the ground yeah yeah I agree I think having watched it back I didn't really obviously like the, the boys didn't have a great view when I was there but the our penalty there's a clear tug on the jersey as well I didn't actually see that he had stamped on him or anything like that but it's just, it more back, coming, it's just more a coming together mark but again like some other players whenever they feel the contact they'll go down yeah you know what I mean but yeah like you said the, the, the pulling the jersey is clear as day is yeah, it setting a dangerous precedent though is it setting a dangerous precedent that every time of course it is of course there's an arm on the shoulder or anything like that inside the box and a player goes down, it's always going to be a penalty. I think it is genuinely, it's quite upsetting. It's quite <laughs> upsetting to watch. It is, mate. It's, I know this leads to a wider discussion, right? But when you look at, the issue for me, right, is, Nate, so people are saying, oh, VAR's push, VAR's this, right? VAR is not the issue. The issue is the folk who are operating it and it's the folk who have got the whistle on a Saturday or a Sunday afternoon. When you look at, I don't know if you have seen it, but um, Kelly St Johnston, St Johnston didn't concede a penalty, right? Andy Considine literally Superman punched the ball away as it came into the box, and they never even checked it. So it's ridiculous. It's, There's a, there was a lot it's of consistency. Our... Like for me, I know you're saying, Sean, it's. Slightly yes. I don't think either penalty is a penalty. I know there is a a a, a pull on his jersey, but if, if that's that, that's the, the, that's the only reason I come going, back to is he trying by, to you know right his wrong. Do you know what I mean? I mean, if you're going by the letter of the law, then it probably is a penalty, right? But like Lee Johnson came out after the game and said, you would need to, you're need to going to start giving three, four, five penalties a game for that. Yeah, because it happens at every single corner. And then even it's, then with the Hibs one, like where do you determine where the contact, so where does the foul actually start? Because if Carter Vickers pulls the jersey first, regardless of what happens secondary to that, it's a foul to Hibs. The same as Eli Ewan sending off, it's a foul to Hibs. And not only that, because of the incompetence of the referees, Eli missed 65 games, eh, sorry, 65 minutes of the game on Saturday, and he's now going to miss the game against Motherwell because we don't have an avenue to appeal it. 
because yeah. it's been a second yellow. For things like that, if there's any ambiguity, the referee gives him a straight red. If he thinks a kick in the head is dangerous, it's a straight red, then it gives him the opportunity to go to VAR. And review it. And then yeah, he can exactly. go and look at it, and he can go, and, like what they've done with the penalty at Tynecastle against us, they can go and fucking forensically examine it to find exactly what the issue is. But again, it's it's the way that, that referees are. And it's not just about Stephen McLean, because I actually think, on balance, he's probably one of the better ones. He is one of the better ones, I think. But he just had a fucking catalogue of howlers that started on Saturday and was summed up by the Abada one as well, when he was about yeah. 40 yards away from it. Yeah. And he was fucking desperate. He was desperate to give that penalty. Mm-hmm. I think, see, when you go back to when you go back to the penalty stuff, Craig, it's we're all calling out for consistency across the board. There's been incidents that I've seen at Easter Road where there's been more vigorous tugs on the shirt. Penalties have not been given. Uh, well, look at what, the abuse, look at the abuse Portia's got for good one. Exactly. For more, for, for more of a um, connection than what the the Carter Vickers one was. There's just no consistency. But then, on see on the flip side of the coin, where do you draw the line as to how how vigorous a pull is a foul, or is any pull a foul? Well, it's this argument though. If it's it, folk always say, "Oh, if that's anywhere else in the park, it's a foul." Well, but is it though? But it should be. If that's depending on the letter of the law, like so, what happened to say what happened to um, Hanlon happens anywhere else in the pitch, right? Immediately, you're you're expecting the ref to blow for a free kick. But for some reason, when it comes to football, the penalty box has got some almost like mythical has to breach a certain threshold for a penalty to be given. It shouldn't matter how strong or how soft the foul is. A foul that's is a what foul it seems foul. like it's that's what it seems like it's being judged on at the moment, though. No. But the thing is, we need to think of a solution as well, because for me, right, the introduction of VAR was was mental, to be honest, because before, like you've just said, Greg, it's it's nothing to do with VAR, and if that doesn't work, it's the people operating it and the people that are on the pitch. And before even thinking about VAR, in my opinion anyway, we needed to make the referees professional. Yeah. The fact that these guys aren't professional, they're part-time referees, they don't have training or facilities, like, what do we expect them to go out on a Saturday and do when they're, they're not getting paid properly, they're going to have to work second jobs? You look down south, they've got training camps, they've got facilities where they practice. Some silly, but they practice offside. They practice every, every aspect of the referee and, and brush up on the rules every single day of their lives. And still get the VAR was ever introduced. <laughs> do you think that's what it should have happened? Do you think we've went the wrong direction, the wrong way? Or do you think, you know, that this is it from now on? We just have to accept We that. shouldn't be implementing VAR halfway through a season. Not yeah, a chance. I was going to, I was going to like, say that. So that, that was a fucking farce. I also think there's an element of when you look at guys like McLean and, and all of that, right? Take McLean and Beaton. Like they're argued about being on either side of the spectrum, whether they've got Celtic leaning connections. That uh, what's his name? Nick Nick Walsh. Nick Walsh is supposedly a PE teacher at a rain like a a PE teacher at a school in a Rangers area. Like for me, these I genuinely believe that. I don't think they're biased or they're influenced, right? They're just incompetent. If you think about it, if, like, we know what Celtic and Rangers fans are like with this. Like, look at what we're like with decisions. Like, we're like, oh, fucking, oh. <laughs> and then we move on with our lives, right? Whereas Celtic and Rangers fans will literally hunt people down and make their lives a fucking misery because of it. I think subconsciously they see a content, so they see something like, he sees something like Ellie Ewan's thing on Saturday, right? And he's like, if, if I don't send them off, what's going to happen? If I don't give this a bad a penalty? Do you think that's going for his head? Don't, like, even the Hibs one. Like, as soon as he's called over to VAR, they're like, it's like, as soon as you know, when they do that signal, you know what's happening. Either way, like, it's it's going to be given. So that's almost like the fail safe is that, right, if, if they're saying it has to be given, I have to give it. But when it comes to the other ones, it's like, what what is my life worth? What's the hassle going to be like if I don't give it? Because I can guarantee you now, at the next old firm game, whether it's at Celtic Park or Ibrox, you put that exact same scenario. Imagine that's at Parkhead, right? And Morelos goes for the ball 
and Starfelt pulls his jersey, there's no fucking way that's been given as a penalty. None. Because it's no worth the hassle. Celtic like won 3 1, and their fans are shouting and raving online about uh, about the throwing. Mm-hmm. Saying the Lewis Miller's foot being off the ground. Yeah, like the 1 3 1, just you've got the three points, move on. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? The one, the one I seen was that um, should the throwing have been pulled back because he was wearing gloves? So surely that helps with grip and propulsion. <laughs> <laughs> like, what the f? They're, they're they, strange, they, strange bunch. Yeah, I said it on Saturday, they're the most entitled. The most entitled set of supporters I think I've ever encountered them my whole life. See, with the Huns, right, you know what you're getting with them. Like, you just know. Like, you know what they are. But I was, I felt, standing at Parkhead, right, that they, it's genuinely like a cult. Yeah. No, I felt like that as well. It is genuine. Like, look at everything, and like, everything Postacoglu says. They hang off his every word. Like, they cheat on, like, some sort of messiah. Like, didn't get me wrong. <clears throat> football's my probably my whole life when out with like my family and all that and I'll be a Habs fan to the day I die but it doesn't like determine how my day to day life lives you didn't wear a, a Lee Johnson a Lee Johnson quote t-shirt do you? you know what <laughs> yeah, I mean exactly. it's just they're, they're literally it's like it's ingrained in them even even the way that the announcer like announces the goal scorers and <laughs> the substitutes and They've got, Even their, they've got, they've got songs music. for every player and, like, I don't know. It's just, it's a very, very, very strange, strange... Ken, what I was laughing at was when the Green Brigade were, like, more like they were jumping, like, side to side and then they were all, like, crouching down and they were going, Celtic, let's go. Oh, mate, it was... It was, like, it was like Cliff Pike was leading the choir. I'm not being funny, mate, but... I was looking at it and I was, even my dad was going, what the fucking hell are they doing? The best thing is, is that they're going on about the kid and creating a, it was only them. Yeah. Like the Celtic fans that were next to us, around to them, and then all the way around their, like, sort of main stand, facing stand, and then behind the, they just sat in their arse the whole game. The only noise that you heard was when they were cheering for the goal. Aye. Aye. Um, Strange. few and controversial decisions pish atmosphere, very much like a library but despite all of that they still managed to, to get the winners in through oh, <laughs> oh who scored in the 81st minute <laughs> and then Hak Sabarovic scored deep in injury time um, in how, many time times have you, how many times have you tried to pronounce his name? What, um, were, you shit, were, you, were you shitting it at trying to pronounce it properly on the pod? Is that right, Hak Sabarovic? I think so I, I, I thought you were talking about oh <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I just want to touch on the substitutes as well, by the way, because we've spoke about this before, right, with the five substitutes. Celtic always do this every week. They bring on their three substitutes in the 60th minute. Um, they did that again, and interestingly enough, two of their three goal scorers were substitutes. Do you think that there is an unfair advantage for the old firm having the five substitutes coming on? Particularly with Celtic, when it's not going their way, they do it every single week. They bring on so much pace and they've got such an unbelievable bench. Um, do you think that is an unfair advantage? Yes, I don't think they're, they're, they're five players that came on, right? Equal their, their transfer fees in coming to Celtic equaled more than Hibs turnover. I don't think it's it creates an unfair advantage, though. It's just the way that it is. I mean, if you are, like, hypothetically speaking, if you're I don't know what Watford or something, and you're playing Man City, then the exact same thing happens, but nobody moans about that. I think well, I think I think they do complain about it down in England, though. Because I, I, the same. Generally, I don't think it's an unfair advantage. I just think it's the way that it is. And if if we had the the resource to bring in all these wonderful players that they are, then you would do it regardless of who you were playing, regardless of you know if you were getting beat, you want to bring on good players to try and turn the game around. It's just the way that football is. I do and think it's, it is reaching a like a tipping point though. Like more and more folk are getting fed up of it. Well, like, how how do you combat it though? Well there isn't I don't know. I mean pull back down to three subs. I I didn't even just mean Let that. Us have five, let them have five. It's bigger than that though, <laughs> just because of the, the gap that Celtic and Rangers are creating for the other two. Or we obviously spoke about last week. Yep. You know, and them going to another level and try to catch them. It's all fine and well. Like I, I mentioned last week, I think excluding that, the rest of the league is very tight. But the other two are just 
continually just going to get more and more and more money because the higher level end of football, so your Champions League and your European events or competitions, sorry, more money is getting plunged into that. So the more often they're in that, the more money they're going to get. So it's just going to continually happen, unfortunately. Like we spoke about last week, there's no ready route to fix it. Like you couldn't go down the MLS style route because it just wouldn't work. Or the A League because I think they've got some sort of salary cap type thing as well. Yeah, they do. Like, ultimately, if Celtic and Rangers are generating the resource that they do, like you can't really stop them from spending it just because it's unfair on the rest of us. Yeah, but, no, that was that's where I was coming from. Yeah, yeah. but at the same time, they're like there's there gets to a point where it's like, what's the fucking point in getting a season ticket for the bet if the best you can hope for starts? And I think it just adds into all the other things that go in the old firm's favour. I think it's just another thing to add to a grown list. You look at, yeah. I know we touched on it last week, I won't get into it too much, but you look at the fact that it's a 12-team league and we've got to play each other about eight times home and away a season. Um, the fact the split as well, so even if you've got a team that's up there that does manage to compete for the league by the time the split comes about, they've got to play the old firm another couple of games. And then now you've obviously got the five subs. You've just got what seems to be a growing list of things that go in the favour of the old firm. So, not ideal. It is, seeming, it is seemingly, like, recently, it seems like a, an unconquerable task to beat either of the old firm. And there's always that pish argument that comes up as well. Oh, no one complains about Bayern Munich in Germany. Because well, we're not in fucking Germany. Like... I couldn't give a rat's arse about German football. Like, it's... It is a complete duopoly, and the issue is is that Rangers have went through their banter years and fucking died and lost all their money, but now, because of their Europa League running all that, selling players like Bassey, like, we can't, we can't even sell a player for, what, two, three million. They're buying subs for three, four million. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Aye. What is the... What is the solution? Do we just revert back to get them to fuck? Is it like, is it a salary cap? Is it get them to fuck, or is there something else that we can do? I think if you see if you brought a salary cap in, if you brought a salary cap in, it would surely need to be proportionate across the different clubs because you can't have, you can't go, oh, there's a X value salary cap and expect St Mirren and Celtic to be on the same salary cap. I think a, a salary cap would then actually be a, a detrimental impact to, to the league because yeah. no, then preventing Celtic and Rangers from doing better in European competition because of the league cap. Not even that. It's, it's You're preventing then teams like Hibs Hearts, Aberdeen, the ones who have got a, a little bit more of a budget to to stretch to get these you know these better players than, that like your Achilles and that can't afford. You're not going to be able to entice them to the league. So yeah. the only players, the only, you know, half decent players that are going to want to come and play in Scotland are going to want to come and play for the old firm because the rest of the teams will only be able to afford them. So I think salary cap is good in some ways, but then I think there's more cons than pros. Maybe an end of season playoff, top four going to a playoff, first v third, second v fourth, one league, league style. Knockout. Yep, one league, no- one game knockout, and that's it. And then a fight to the death. Yep. And it becomes like the, I suppose, like American sports say when the regular season just means absolutely fuck all. And yep. it all, it's all down to the playoffs. <laughs> well, maybe we should split the regions. The that's Edinburgh the division. <laughs> that's the way the playoffs work anyway, though, isn't it? Like, you just need to finish fourth. Or was it the championship? You need to finish fifth. Six. Six. Is it fifth? Six. There you go. Six. Fifth, six. Mental. Well... We'll move on from the Celtic game, but overall, I think the assessment is that um, it certainly went better than what I expected. I was expecting a 7 8 or 8 0 drubbing, but fortunately, it was only 3 1, so goal difference isn't impacted too much. Um, <laughs> we'll move on to the, the race for third, I suppose, because up north, our Edinburgh rivals got their arses handed to them in Pataudry. They were beat 3 0, which has really opened up that race for third. Um, there's now five points between Hearts, Aberdeen and Hibs with Aberdeen leapfrogging us. Liam, what's your take on the race for third now? Who do you expect to get third come the end of the season or even by the time the split comes? 
Oh, it's a difficult one. I don't know what to put my neck out there and say anyone because I think that Hearts are in a little bit of a free fall. Um, not not particularly a free fall, but I think the fans are beginning to get on Nielsen's back, get on the players' back. Aberdeen seem to have found some half decent form under Barry Robson, and I think now that we've got Celtic and Rangers out of the way, we'll then go back on a half decent run again. So it's difficult. It's difficult. I think it will. I think it will probably be between us and Hearts for third going into the split. I'd probably lean towards Hearts, maybe by a point or by goal difference. Uh, when the split comes, but then by the end of the season, I have I've not got a clue. Yeah, I mean to put in a wee bit of perspective, just going by current form. So Hearts have obviously, you know, they've lost to um, the Drew Livingston, they lost to Motherwell, some heavy defeats to the Old Firm in the league and Scottish Cup. Um, whereas Hibs taking away the Old Firm went on that pretty good run before that. How many was it? Nine in a row? Or Seven like games, that, I think. Five um, wins, two draws. And now Aberdeen under Barry Robson have won four of the, the five matches. So going by that, the only advantage you give to Hearts though is that they do have that that bit of cushion. Um, Sean, what do you think about it all? Uh, I think Hearts will finish third, unfortunately. I think they'll just have too much. Um, I'll put my neck on the line and if it goes any other way, I'll be happy in some way, shape or form. Um, I do actually think that Hearts will drop more points between now and the split. They've got Kelly away, tough place to go. St Mirren, um, I think they'll beat, I think they'll draw with us. And they've got Ross County at home. Ross County will be potentially maybe still trying to fight here or there. Um, St Mirren are still trying to get into the top six or there thereabouts. So it'll be a tough game. We've obviously got Motherwell at home. You'll be looking, I mean, any home game you should be trying to win. So I'd be expecting that from us. Dundee United away. They're certainly not making the top six. So um, <laughs> it'll be interesting to see uh, how they are because they'll, they'll be fighting for their lives as well. So that will be a tough game. Hopefully we don't slip up there. You've then got the Hearts one. St Johnston will be in, in in the fight for top six as well. Um, so I think, it is, I think it's more of a case of only because Hearts have got the cushion, I think it's more of a case of a fight for fourth, um, if I'm being brutally honest. And if I had to put my neck on the line, I do think that we will pip Aberdeen. Um, Unless they get an even better manager bounce, if they you know employ someone, then I think it will be really really tight. Craig, are you feeling similar to that, or are you a bit more optimistic? I'm trying to look at sort of bigger picture wise with it, and that if we if the top six stays as it is, we will play. I think it's three out of five games away from home. We'll be due to go to Petardry, Ibrox, and Tynecastle. So. For me, we need to be looking at 12 out of 12 in the next run of games to have any chance of making third. Because then your other game in the split after the split is Celtic at Easter Road. And then you've got potentially St Mirren or Livy or whoever. I don't know what one would be at home. It would probably be Livy at home and St Mirren maybe at home as well, depending on how the fixtures have worked out. Because I know that there's going to be, I think Hearts are going to have to end up putting an extra game away from home because they've had Celtic and Rangers at home twice already maybe I don't know how that's going to work um, but I'm I'm feeling a bit more optimistic only because when we looked at this run of, we looked at this run of games a few weeks ago as we started kind of cutting the gap to Harps and we probably amongst us said that we wouldn't have expected to get any points out of nine based on how shite our record is in Livingston and the fact that we're playing both the old firm the fact that we've came through that game spell and Harps haven't increased their lead on us and the fact that they've turned against Nielsen big time. Um, like, they're fucking raging because he's away to Turkey to get his barnet sorted. <laughs> I've seen that. <laughs> this week when they want him on the training park. So, I reckon if they their record after the split in the top six is horrendous as well. I reckon, if anything, if we can pick up maximum points before the split, chances of that. But I reckon third could be between us and, us and Aberdeen and Hearts really properly scrambling because they've taken, and I said this I said this a f- like a few months ago, they've still hit their bad run. Like They seem to be picking up points when they're playing shite. Now they're playing shite and they're getting nothing for it. So I'm actually more optimistic, but we need, we need to win all of the games before the split, I think, to be in with 
with a chance. And it adds a wee bit of, adds a wee bit of sauce to the remaining Edinburgh derbies, do you not think? Because if we were looking forward from, say, sort of January time on the back of those defeats, those 3 0 defeats to Hearts in the Cup in the league, when we were looking at this game in April, we'd probably have been saying that's for pride. And we would have also potentially been saying that'll be the last Edinburgh derby because we'll finish in the bottom six. So the fact that we are coming in at that game with you know, talking about even getting third, talking about the fact that it'll close the gap, I think that just makes that a much better Edinburgh derby for, for everyone involved. But like Sean just touched on, the remaining fixtures, Motherwell at home, Dundee United away, Hearts at home, and then the last game before the split is St Johnson away. Clendo, how many points at the 12 is that? I think we need 12. Like Craig says, I think we really need 12. How many do you think we're getting? I'd be happy with nine. I'd be ha- I'd be happy with eight. I'd be happy with eight. I'd be delighted with nine. I'd be ecstatic with twelve. I'm going confident. I think we get twelve out of twelve. I think we win those four games. We get twelve out of twelve. And I think I'm going to go one one extra here. No doubt Sean will clip this in four games time. But I'm going to say that by the time the split comes, we are sitting comfortably in third. <laughs> Comfortably, Love with that. Dundee United in fourth. <laughs> <laughs> Dundee United chasing our tails. <laughs> Sean, what about you? How many out of twelve? Um, I echo what Liam said, but I think we'll get six. Oof, six. I don't think oh, our is going to. I, I, I think we're going to oh, bounce back for these two games. No, um, I think I think I think it'll be a win in three goals. <clears throat> Interesting. A win in three draws. So are we drawn against United? Yeah, well, yeah, because they're fighting for their lives. And it's top six push. Yeah. Craig, how many out of twelve do we get? I think ten. Ooh, that's a generous one. That's a generous one. Ten. I think the it'll be ten if we draw against Hearts, but it'll be twelve if we beat them. Because I reckon if we beat them, that'll take us on to St Johnston absolutely flying. Um, Motherwell at home, they've not been any great shakes this season. Um, and Dundee United are home cannon fodder. We've got a half decent record against Motherwell at home as well, I think, in recent years. So, and I do, I do believe that it'll be one of those things where everything comes together in that game uh, on the fifteenth of April at home. To hearts and free no hearts. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just do you know what? It's it's the it's almost getting to the crunch time. Like it's in no way comparable. But the cup final, can we've we lost to Ross County. We then couldn't even finish second. We then lost to Falkirk. It's like it's for me. I just feel like this season has went so bad at times that now we're on that upward curve that we're not actually going to dip off it again, we're just going to keep going up. And I think it will it would be just rewards for the persistence of uh, not only the fans, but also Lee Johnson himself, if we can beat Hearts. If we, if we beat Hearts, I, I have as massive favourites to finish third. Because yes, I think, that, I yes, think that that will stuff in, that'll knock the stuffing right out of them. But then conversely, if they keep on this run of form, the one game that they would want out of any... As Hibs at Easter Road. Yeah, definitely. So I just, I just think that the way the seasons went, like the, the narrative of the season and the way the seasons unfolded so far, um, I just think it's, it's now we're now coming into our own. We're, we're on that upward. I know we've lost heavily in our last um, two games against the Old Firm, but we're still on an upward trend, whereas they're on their way down. Um, and Aberdeen, I mean, we've seen. Like the four one game up there was never a four one game, and we absolutely fucking pumped them at home. Like that's still the same players that are in the building. So I think aye. the thing that Hart should maybe be a bit concerned about is you know there seems to be a bit of a feel good factor at both ourselves and Aberdeen now. Aberdeen see themselves as being back; they'll probably fancy themselves massively for third place. Hibs, you know, we take away the old firm games. We're on brilliant form. You know, that culminating in that game at uh, the Tony Macaroni, I think, was brilliant. And that connection with the fans seemed to be back. Whereas, like we say, Hearts have turned against their manager, they've turned against the players, and it just seems to be 
all a bit toxic there at the moment. So fingers crossed it stays like that and we can absolutely all happen at the right time, hopefully. Yeah, definitely. Right, I think it's that time for a cheeky wee Celtic Park pie review. Which pie is the best in the pie review? Which pie is the best in the pie review? So, um, I'm taking myself out of the equation here because I've already done it, but I think it's quite a big moment, isn't it? Because, McClendo, it is... The last but, box to be ticked. McClendo has now rated every single pie in the cinch. An incredible achievement. So congratulations. And Craig, did you do a, your own pie review? You did. Yep. Perfect. Did. Well, I'll start with you, Craig. Um, well, my price is a one for Celtic Park. Um, only because the their weird dynamic pricing really pisses me off. <laughs> um, so I got a, obviously as the, as the Premiership table dictates, it has to be steak and gravy. Um, so for myself, Liam and Alfie, steak and gravy pie and a coke came to sixteen quid. And a bovro, you got a bovro as well. Oh, sorry, and a bovro. Aye, so three pies, a coke, and a bovro, sixteen quid. Um, but even though I didn't get a scotch pie, the fact that it's three pounds thirteen severely pisses me off. So that <laughs> is up. Um, I wonder about those fucking disco lights. Jesus Christ! Temperature. Um, I've given it a three because it just felt about right. It was a wee bit, wee bit too hot on the outside, but a wee bit too cool on the inside. So it sits, sits right in the middle for me. Uh, filling. I've given a three. Um, tasty gravy I'll give them that but not enough steak to fill it out just seemed to be a lot of sauce without a lot of a lot of meat inside um, and crust would have been a three however as we all know here on the Ramble the lift determines what way the score goes and it was a straight up and down lift no sticking to the tray um, no sogginess on the underneath of the pie with the crust, so I've given the crust a four. So nice rim, overall, nice rim, Craig. An okay. overall um, pie score for Celtic Park for me is eleven, which I feel is actually pretty generous. It's respectable. It's respectable. So next up, we've got right, the conqueror of the Cinch Pimer League. I think you need to strap yourselves in <clears throat> because this is the most turbulent pie I've had this season. <laughs> <laughs> We're starting off with temperature for Celtic, and they are straight in with a rating of five. Oof. The temperature on my pie, Craig. I don't know if we got the same batch or Wait, if maybe yours. Is... Batch. She handed me in the same hand. There was literally <laughs> two of the same pies. My temperature, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, in my correct opinion, was a five. The perfect temperature. That uh, a little bit warmer than lukewarm, warmed warmed you up. Uh, it was pretty cold on Saturday, so it, it warmed you up nicely. Now we're coming back down to average with pastry. Like Craig says, perfect liftage. A little bit soggy in parts, a nice crispy rim. <laughs> I'm giving it a three. Uh, soggy in parts, but on the whole, fairly good. Is the notes I've got in my in my phone here. This is where it gets let down. Filling. One. Bland. Tasteless. Grisly. Yes, the gravy was nice. The gravy was all right. Doesn't make up for absolute garbage meat. It could you, That could have been dog food inside that pie and I wouldn't have been able to tell the difference. We literally got uh, the same fucking pies. <laughs> eh? We literally got the same... She lifted them for the thing and Craig, we, we Craig, go... Craig. I didn't interrupt you, so don't you interrupt me. I just, I just didn't understand how it could be so different when it was the same. Well, I've obviously got a more advanced palate than you. Um, and then finally to round it off, I'm going f- price three. And to be honest, I could have given this a five because I never paid anything for it anyway because <laughs> Craig paid for it. But uh, I gave it a three. £3.35 kind of sits in my kind of middle of the road prices for across the league this season for the 12 pies that I've tasted. Um, which gives Celtic a 
fairly average score of 12 out of 20 for me to complete my uh, my pie table. And I'm I'm so proud of it. I've never been more eager to complete something in my life. I tell you what, there can be many people that have had a steak and gravy pie at every single Singe Premiership ground in one season. So that, fair play to you. That's so much that was a pipe dream back when we first started this, Liam, over 14 months ago. The Pioneership table was something we wanted to bring different to the to the Hiberniverse, as I'll call it. <laughs> and I have been with you on this journey from day dot, and I couldn't be prouder of you. Well done. Well I done. just want to say a big thank you to um, everyone that's supported me so far. Um, of course, you three... Uh, my family, uh, I think that they have, you know, supported me through thick and thin, through crispy, through soggy, uh, through grisly, through tasteless, and this, this is for them. This is for them. I think that's plenty, to be honest. We are, I think, going to be doing an end of season review where we'll talk about the the best and worst pie. So, strap yourselves in for that, folks, because that will be coming soon. Um, and that concludes this week's pie review. I think we should now move on to our brilliant listeners' questions. Now it's time to answer the Hib Ramble listener questions. So I'm going to start off with a question from Billy, and this actually relates back to what we were talking about earlier in regards to the five subs rule. So should there be a rule that two of the five subs have to be an under-21 academy player? The rule of five subs now does nothing but help the old firm. How can we compete with that? So what's your thoughts on that? Celtic and Rangers will just buy the best under-21 players that they can afford and then chip them in. Instead. I think it's a nice idea. I do think it's a nice idea. But we don't even we don't even bring on players that are under-21. So kind of defeats the... I, I don't know. It's a nice idea, but I don't think it'll happen. Yeah, I don't think so either. I think even if they were to um, bring their under twenty ones, the remaining players they could bring on would still be far superior to what, mm. what we have. Craig, any thoughts? I mean, that used to be a rule, didn't it? You used, you used to have to include either two or three under twenty one players on their bench, um, and it was all that happened was is that two under twenty one players just didn't get any game time. So, no, nah, I don't see the subs thing making much of a difference at all. This one is from a Mr. Colin McLennan, an incredibly proud father after his son has completed the Singe Pie Membership. <laughs> and um, also the pioneer of the f- I Am Brew flavour, I Am Brew. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to give a bit of background for our listeners on this. So we were at the pub before it and I ask Craig's laddie if he wants anything from the bar and he says, I'll have some crisps. Now, I also asked Colin what you want from the bar and he said, an iron brew. So I said, of course, speaking to Craig's son, what flavour would you like? And Colin responds to it, saying, iron, bo- iron brew flavour, please. <laughs> incredible stuff. Incredible oh, stuff. my God. Colin, thanks for providing that. <laughs> Just piece of butter. Um, if you could take one player from any team in the SPFL, who would it be and who would they replace in the current starting eleven? Are we including old firm? Yeah, don't see why not. I guess we'll we'll do one where you can go to Old Firm, then one from outside the Old Firm, if you wish. I was thinking about this earlier, and I, I don't you. know. I'm kind of torn between two for the Old Firm as well. Kim, what? No, Kim, I'm going to go Tavernier. I'm going to go Tavernier. What? Get a minute, right wing back. Yeah. With all the players you could pick, you picked Tavernier. Yeah. I was going to say Jota, but I like our front three. And he doesn't get in ahead of Harry McCurdy for me. For shits and giggles, I'll take Morelos. <laughs> imagine imagine him at him stop. He'd be but human. Seriously, I'd probably probably Hatati, I think maybe. Hatati in the midfield. Who does he replace? Joe Neal. Um, 
I was going to wait till last because if I jumped in with Hitati, I was expecting jokes to be flying from Craig and Liam. So, um, but, but for, for me, Hitati is one of the best players in the league. So, um, and like similar to Liam, I do think Jot is up there, but I wouldn't want to disrupt our outrageously good front line. Plus, his hair pisses me off. Does he get as many goals for us as well? I can he's a good player, but does he get as many goals playing in a more average it's, side? It's as just better player? than what, what we have. I'm so. going to go with something different. I'm going to go with either... Well, I'll go, I'll go with uh, Carter Vickers, thinking long-term, because I think he's a quality centre-half, knows how to play the game, and I think that if we lose Will Fish, um, we could use him. So I'm going to go with... We, we could downgrade to Carter Vickers. <laughs> um, got a question here from Keith. Can see why you. Oh, wait, what about, what about uh, non old firm? All right, I don't know if you'd actually wanted to do that. Do you want to do that? Yeah, I'll, I'll do it. And I'll take uh, I'll take Lauren Shankland. And he can take. You just Ethan said you didn't want to interrupt our front line. He can take Ethan Laidlaw's space on the bench. Right, okay. The, be- the space on the bench that he doesn't get. Doesn't even <laughs> um, I would I would have went Craig Gordon pre leg break, um, so I don't really know what I would do. Came back walking about four weeks after it. Ah, I know, I know. Um, I actually don't know. Duke. Ah, that's what I was thinking as well. Duke. I'd go with Duke as well. Um, so moving on, we've got a question from Keith. Can see why Yuan has been given the second yellow, but he's dragged down. If it's the other way around, do Celtic get the red card? No, absolutely not. No, no way. Don't think so. I think that's a unanimous verdict that that's absolutely wouldn't be the case. It actually was a foul committed by the Celtic player. Somehow the referee's given that as a red card, so I think that gives. All I think you- if the rules were reversed, Yuan would still get sent off. Um, we've got a message now from Gav Dick. I'm not going to, now Gav, I'm not going to criticise your spelling, punctuation or anything else. Don't worry. Are you saying that there is something there to criticise but you're I, choosing I'm, not? I've not looked into it but I'm just going to go with the question because I'm not that not that mean, Gav. So thoughts on Miller's performance? thought he was decent along with JDH. We did touch on it earlier but Liam, what was your thoughts? I was really impressed with him. Um, from what I've seen from Lewis Miller this season, at the start of the season, I was thinking, oh, he's maybe out his depth a wee bit. But from what I've seen of him uh, in the last few weeks, I'm, I'm quite impressed. And I'm looking forward to seeing him playing again. I was, I, was, I was really impressed with him. My thoughts are, why has Gav put a comma after a question mark? And that's all that. <laughs> I've seen that as well. <laughs> Gav, that didn't come from me. All right. <laughs> Sean, what's your thoughts on Miller's performance? Um, I spoke to... My, my cousin who plays a fo- football in Australia and they were laughing that Lewis Miller got a move to Hibs. Um, <clears throat> so that kind of summed it up for me, although he had such a good season in the in the A-League when he was over there. So I was very sceptical um, of that. Um, his performance at the weekend was, was good, it was solid. Like the boys said earlier on, the, the people he was up against he done really, really well. Let's hope it's just maybe something to, to build on more than anything else. And uh, yeah, I'd, Jake Doyle Hayes gets a lot of criticism, like a lot of our midfielders, whenever they don't do anything other than pass the ball sideways or back, backwards. But again, he done what he was meant to do at the weekend. So fair play to him. And, you know, long may all our consistent performance performers from the weekend continue. Yeah, I was really impressed with them both. But in particular, I thought, GDH was my man of the match on our end anyway. Thought he's he was throwing his body about. I thought he was he was committed to challenging. He was driving us forward. He played very much that John McGinn role. Dare I say it? Um, but I thought he was really impressive and Miller as well. I thought was really good. And what adds to it is the fact that I know we touched on it earlier, but the fact that you know these guys are both coming back from from injury. They've been pretty plagued by an inj- injury, and to come in and put a performance like that at Celtic Park is pretty impressive. Um, our favourite question from our favourite rambler, John, what's for dinner? So, Mark, this is where I'm going to criticise you for the first time tonight because we always lead with that, with the listener questions. Sorry, John. I've let, I've let everyone down. I, I, can, I, can chop, I can chop and change it and I can put it at the start. <laughs> I, 
Um, that's me. I've handed in my resignation from <laughs> hosting the Rambo, John, and I would like to personally apologise to you. Um, <laughs> but what's for dinner, everyone? Uh, yeah, I had mince and tatties. I had a late lunch, so I've not I'm yet to eat, and I don't know what I'm having yet. Don't roll your I'm eyes, Craig. I've not had my dinner yet, but I'm having sirloin steak, medium rare, skin on fries, peppercorn sauce, garlic mushrooms. I am having homemade paella tonight. Ooh. So no vegan sausage rolls. Actually having a, a decent dinner for once. <laughs> Sean, no inkling on what you're having? No, no pasta? No creamy pasta coming yeah, up? Probably, no? I don't know. I don't know yet. Right, we'll, um, we'll find out we'll at half ten. Chomp on a cucumber or something. <laughs> Uh, an interesting question from James here. Why can you not appeal a suspension for a second jail card and should we just play you in against well and say fuck the SFA? Well, I'm going to start on this one, James. If you think back to our League Cup campaign, we did field a suspended player and we are removed from the competition. So I don't think it would go down well. Um, but it is an interesting conversation about why we cannot appeal a second yellow. And also opening up the discussion even wider, why can't VAR intervene if it's a second jail that leads to a red? Surely they should be able to get involved. From a VAR perspective, what if the second challenge was the worst out of the two, but the first one was the contentious one? You then can't remove the first yellow. Yeah, and then if you're stopping it for every yellow card, then the game's... I mean, we've seen it on Saturday, there was 15 minutes injury time. No, but I think... It's, that's that's not the point though. I think that if there's two yellows, the first yellow, regardless of how contentious the first yellow is, if it's a second yellow and a red, but it's there's a bit of doubt, then I think you should be able to check. No, it does I think, I think, where, where would you stop? Where would you draw the line? Only think, only if it's a second yellow that leads to a red card. I guess the other option would just be that the referee, when anyone's on a yellow card, if he thinks it's a contentious challenge, just pulls out a straight red so that he can go and yep. check the VR. Yep. However, that is essentially just checking every second yellow anyway, because he's just it's the same situation. Can what I mean? It's just the difference is he's We'd shown still a straight get red. Parkied now, if that was the case, I think it's in terms of reviewing yellow cards because yellow cards typically aren't given for dangerous. Felt like you look red cards are only really given for dangerous tackles or um, things like like deliberate handball, preventing goal scoring opportunities, etc. Yellow cards are typically given for multiple fouls, a cynical shirt tug when the team's breaking up the park. Like, so you can't really, you can't really appeal those type of things because I think yellow cards are more set in stone than red cards at times. Surely if it's a, a if it's two yellows, it leads to a red there should also be an appeal process or like a, an option to appeal. Yeah, I do think there should be if, if it leads to the red. I, but then, it, like, like Sean has said, it would just open up so many cans of worms because then every single yellow card would you would see it as contentious because there's never really a, a there's no really a set threshold for a yellow card where there is for a red. Yeah, no, I suppose so. Like, I just want Elio to play against Motherwell. If the penalty on Saturday that we got, Starfelt should have in theory been booked. But it wasn't. Yeah. So. Um, our final question of the night is from Lorenzo. Um, do you think we will manage to keep this team at at least 70%? They finally look solid. We had to wait, but Celtic had to wait for the last 10 minutes to score the winner at home against a 10-man team. I see a positive future. So I'm assuming when you say keep it 70%, you're meaning fitness um, so I'm not sure how we answer that one how do we keep our team at fitness We've good news is we don't have any cups to play in we're not in Europe so we've only got the league to contend with what's your thoughts boys I don't know if you mean 70% fitness or like 70% of how we've actually been performing yeah, I think 70% <clears throat> personnel on the side I'm not quite sure either that Celtic game fills me with a lot more confidence than a 3-1 defeat should yeah in all honesty Um I felt exactly what Lorenzo said there. It's taken them 80 minutes and two set pieces to actually score a goal against us. I said it at the time, I went, Celtic are absolutely atrocious at scoring goals or we're just half decent at the back. I we maybe rode our luck at times, but I mean, at the end of the day, 
if you if you don't defend well against Celtic, we know what happens. You concede more than three goals, you get absolutely pumped, especially at Parkhead. So, well, compare that to how we defended against Rangers. Like exactly. Again, the amount of times Sakala got down the right hand side, almost unopposed. Whereas, I don't really remember many times of Jota, Meda, Abada, Haksabanovic really getting down the outside. Like going causing down, us proper issues. Yeah, down outside the fullbacks and then cutting in. Um, so now I think it was, thinking back, it was actually weirdly entertaining to see how strong defensively we were. And again, it sounds laughable saying that when we've lost 3-1, but when you look behind the context and actually look into what the 3-1 scoreline came up, how it came about, like defensively, it was actually really good to see us mentally strong because that was all about concentration. Mm. And, and if you compare the way that we got beat by Rangers the game before. Yeah, exactly. And that concludes tonight's episode, tonight's listeners' questions. Thank you very much, as always, for joining me. And um, thanks for, for listening. Um, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and uh, keep getting us here on YouTube. Thanks. Cheers, boys. Can I say, yes. can I say well done, Mark? Well done. Yeah, well Did done, a great Mark. job hosting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank I you. I, I'm never doing that again. I can confirm <laughs> that. I'm never doing that again. I'm not as good as Craig, that's for sure. Oh, Liam, you taking that? I'm or Liam, or Liam, or Liam, or Liam. I'm, I'm happy not hosting. I'm well, happy anyway, hosting. thank you for making my first and last podcast an absolute pleasure. Has Mark mentioned that this is the first and last time he's hosted. Again. <laughs> oh, <I'm done. laughs> See you later.